in my house, the first nails were uh, handmade out of a uh, nail rod. Characteristics of the blacksmith made nail is a uh, uh, head that you can see actual facets on. If you see two nails next to each other, you'll realize that the heads are all slightly different. Uh, there's the nails are tapered from the rod size, which you know in this case is about 3 16 by 3 16. Um, the nails are tapered down to a point and then put in a header and headed down. The nails are divided up, we call them we, by their length, we call them, we call it pennies. There was a time long ago when the combination of the labor that it took a blacksmith to pound out the nail and the cost of the nail rod would make the nails less valuable for small ones than for big ones. Not that it took much less labor to make a small one than a big one, but it took a lot less metal. And so you could buy a hundred of these nails for four pennies. You could buy a hundred of these nails for six pennies. The penny count on the nails became a vestigial form of measuring the length of a nail. It wasn't that someone in America was getting paid four pennies for a hundred of these nails and by the rod. The nails were much more expensive than that. In the mid 1700s, we were buying most of our nail rod from England and you had to come up with some of the king's money to send to England to buy that nail rod to bring it in. And so nails were pretty darn expensive. They were, we were way past the day when these were four pennies for a hundred. They made thousands of little nails like this for the lath in my house. Uh, and the clever Yankee carpenters they would try to come up with a way to avoid using a nail. And one of the places that we saw this over and again in the house is where the corner post casings uh, are set in the corners of the rooms and the lath is run to either side of the corner post casing. They came up with the idea of cutting a groove in the casing board, making it a little bit wider, letting a little bit of it float, so to speak, into the wall cavity, and cutting a, a groove in it, or as we say, a plow, and then taking their pieces of lath, slightly sharpening the ends, and drive them into that plow and that would really quite rigidly hold that lath in place on that corner. The laths are longer and they would be nailed to the studs as they went down the wall, but they got to save and nail in every piece of lath up and down either side of each of the casings in the room. This was a technique for anchoring the lath and avoiding to spend the money, the king's money for a, a, a nail in each end of each one. Um, now, in one respect, it says that that labor was cheap and then cheaper than iron. But another thing that I think was part of their interest was to keep the economy local. That rather than paying money, putting it on a boat and sending it away, where that money was then gone, by hiring someone and spending the extra time to sharpen the ends of the lath so they would fit in that plow and plowing these pieces of wood, a lot of labor went into that much more than it would take to just nail in those nails. But that money that they spent on that labor stayed in town, which is sort of a lesson that we're trying to learn today, relearn today, that if you can keep some of your money in town by buying things locally, and by managing your uh, expenses locally, then that money comes around in your economy a lot sooner than if you send it off to Washington or Detroit. So, that's my story about nails. What would be really fascinating is to take a little field trip to Peter Hapney's and uh, have him demonstrate how he makes nails today out of, uh, instead of pieces of wrought iron, how he makes them out of pieces of steel. And you might get a kick out of seeing it. We'll catch you there.